November 28th. That's not actually election day. Okay. Um, happy Hump Day, sports fans. Alex Wagner here with me tonight on our show. Our, our storybook adventure tonight. We'll have an evangelical exploration, a Russian subplot, and of course, time travel. But first, on a day when Hillary Clinton's campaign is talking bullishly about taking the fight to Donald Trump in three traditionally bright red states, that would be Utah, Georgia, and Arizona, the Republican nominee is tripling down on his whole crooked Hillary Clinton motif. Today, Trump's campaign released a new menacing TV ad about alleged corruption in Clinton world, depicting a Democratic nominee that, quote, only cares about money, power, and herself. Trump and his team have been hammering away on this message for the past 24 hours, but the candidate has also been directing a stream of even more crackling fire towards his own party and suggesting that a D.C. insider's conspiracy is afoot. The shackles are some of the establishment people that are weak and ineffective people within the Republican Party, senators and others, uh, and Paul Ryan. They don't give the support that we really need. Okay. I think we should get support, and we don't get the support from guys like Paul Ryan. He had a conference call yesterday with congressmen, with, with hundreds of them, and they practically rioted against him on the phone. One person stuck up for him. So I'm just tired of non-support. Already the Republican nominee has a massive a massive disadvantage and especially when you have the leaders not putting their weight behind the people wouldn't you think that paul ryan would call and say good going in front of just about the largest audience for a second night debate in the history of the country so, you know, you'd think that they'd say, great going, Don, let's go, let's beat this crook. She's a crook, let's beat her, we gotta stop it. No, he doesn't do that. There's a whole deal going on this. If we had a little help from our very weak leadership called Republican leadership, we'd be sailing like you've never sailed before. Today, congressional surrogates for Donald Trump reportedly held a conference call with campaign manager Kellyanne Conway and pleaded that the Donald stop attacking House Speaker Paul Ryan. Alex, yesterday on this show, hi Alex. Hi John. <laughs> yesterday we had a nice long talk about whether Donald Trump's fight with his own party is a strategy that will be a winning one for him. But the question I have to ask you today is what do you think the broader implications for the Republican Party, candidates up and down the ballot, what are the implications for them if Trump keeps going down this path. I think the implications are sowing a very, sowing the seeds of a bitter harvest, John. If Donald Trump loses, which the polling at this present moment, 20 odd days before the election says he will, there will be a massive amount of finger pointing. And what he is doing now is going to exacerbate the tension and the acrimony tenfold. You saw after Mitt Romney's loss in 2012, Republicans said, I mean, there were divergent schools of thought. He wasn't conservative enough. We didn't get the right support. He didn't have the base, whatever. With Trump, once again, there will be litigation. But because the break has happened before the election, the, the notion that the wagons can circle up and, and sort of come, there can be a sort of a tribal gathering that will result in a new, reshaped, better, stronger Republican Party, I think that is a fallacy at this point, given where we are today. Right. You went, as you often do, uh, first to poetry and then to the big picture. And to uh, agriculture. And agriculture. You're a famous farmer. Um, I'm going to go a little more medium in here and like talk about this very good story in the New York Times today. Jonathan Martin and Alex Burns wrote about just what's going on with down ballot Republicans in, in, in contested Senate races and House races who are looking at Trump attacking Paul Ryan, looking at him attacking John McCain, looking at him attacking the whole Republican power structure. And they're freaking out because their view is, and the pollsters and strategists around them, that when Trump does this, he's obviously hurting himself because. Trump needs all the Republicans to come to Trump, but if he's trashing Republicans, that, that's not going to help. But that a lot of these voters, college-educated, suburban voters, hearing this, their attitude is going to be, you know what, I'm not going to vote for Trump, and if I'm not going to vote for Trump, I'm just going to stay home. I don't want to, I don't want to go out and just vote for Pat Toomey or Kelly Ayotte or any of these other Republican senators who are in tough races. And so they're worried about turnout, that Trump is going to drive away the votes they need to win their races. And that is causing, uh, we've seen this panic happening all week. That's a large part of it right now is that Trump, they're worried that not just just they will have to deal with Trump's controversial statements and have to figure out how to navigate that, but that he will hurt them by driving away voters, keeping them home that they need. I just also wonder what the calculation is in terms of coming out with your disavowal 
at this point in time? I mean, does that even win you, setting aside the turnout question, does that even win you any point? It's October. Right. They have had moments like this through the campaign. Arguably, this is the worst week for the Trump campaign. But still, for a Republican voter who is looking for a principled stand against Trump, is taking that stand at this point in time meaningful? Well, I think, you know, look, it, there, it, there are 27 days left. And given the course of this campaign so far, there's a chance that Donald Trump will say or do other things that you're going to have to deal with one way or the other, either disavow or or not. But I, you got to figure out the strategy here because things could get a lot worse. Okay, John, how is the Republican Party responding to post-debate Donald Trump? How are they? Well, it's complicated. As you may recall, over the weekend, a number of GOP officials publicly broke with their party's nominee and said Trump should leave the ticket. Apparently, some of them have now had a change of heart. Just days ago, the third-ranking Republican in the Senate, John Thune of South Dakota, called for Trump to step aside and called the things he said in 2005 about women, quote, more offensive than anything I've ever seen. And yet today, Thune suggested that he was still going to vote for Trump, telling the Rapid City Journal, quote, I'm certainly not going to vote for Hillary Clinton. And he wasn't the only one. Nebraska Senator Deb Fischer and Alabama Congressman Bradley Byrne also reversed their disendorsements of Trump in the past 24 hours. Others are sticking to their guns for now. Alaska Senators Lisa Murkowski and Dan Sullivan were the latest Republicans to hurl themselves off the Trump train, going as far as quitting their positions in the state party in protest of the Republican nominee. All right, John, so of all the Republicans that now have renounced Trump, there is a fork in the road. <laughs> to stay as someone who has not endorsed him, to re-endorse him, where do they go from here? It doesn't seem like there should be a fork in the road, right? You know, uh, <laughs> you've there was chosen this, your this thing, you've, right, it's like you, you, he said these things, the tapes came out, you went out on the weekend, you said, this is disgusting and disgraceful, which it is, and I can no longer tolerate uh, endorsing Donald Trump, I'm not gonna endorse him, I'm gonna vote for him, he's gotta get off the ticket. And now, what has happened in the last 72, 96 hours that makes you think, you know what, actually, that whole thing last weekend, I, I, not a big deal. I'm with him. I'm, I'm back with him again. I, these people are like profiles in yes. anti-courage, but also <laughs> stupidity. Because it's not just that they're being timidly, timidly, timid, cowardly and timid. It's they're looking like, like, Goons. Well, <laughs> I feel like what they are revealing that? themselves to be politically craven. Yes. Th that it is so clearly what is under the auspices of a principled stand clearly becomes transparently a craven political decision made from the most sort of expeditious decisions. I mean, the idea that you're going to say this is so wrong and, and, and morally reprehensible and then within the same week... Right. Turn around and say, but I still am not rescinding my endorsement and I'm going to vote for him. Seems completely flummoxing. I, I will tell you, I just think, but, but I do think it's going to happen again because, you know, the bottom line is what we Wait, you seen. think they're going to re unendorse well, him? No, I think you're going to see more of this, right? I mean, if Trump starts to rise in the polls, we don't know yet. We, we, have, we saw him obviously take a dip over the weekend where there's been some very limited polling data that suggests that he's maybe starting to stabilize a little bit, but still in the like mid to high 30s. But if he starts to creep up to 41, 42, 43 again, I, the Republican Party has been totally craven around him altogether. I think there are going to be people who are going to be like, ah, you know, I got to get back with this guy. Uh, it doesn't make any sense to me. All right. <laughs> Foremost among the myriad Trump supporters put in an awkward position by the release of that Access Hollywood tape on Friday are Republican evangelicals, Christian conservatives, who are being forced to choose between voting, as they almost always do, for a Republican candidate and, on the other hand, seeming to condone Donald Trump's screamingly impious behavior. Some high-profile Christian leaders, like Jerry Falwell Jr., the president of Liberty University, have stuck by the Republican nominee so far. And so, Donald Trump's running mate, Mike Pence, was in friendly territory today when he visited Liberty University's campus and reiterated his belief that Trump should be absolved of his past transgressions. You know, I was asked on a television program the next morning how I, as a Christian, could move beyond those moments and accept an apology. And I was happy to explain that to the television host. I said, you know, as, as a believer, we're called, to, we're called to aspire to live godly lives. But also we recognize that we all fall short. And it's not about condoning what is said and done. It's about believing in grace and forgiveness. As Christians, we are called to forgive even as we've been forgiven. So not all evangelicals agree with Mike Pence's sentiment. 
uh, the executive editor of Christianity Today magazine, wrote a scathing editorial about Trump in its latest is issue, saying that sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed are, quote, an incredibly apt summary of Donald Trump's life to date. And the piece continues, quote, Trump is an idolater in many other ways. He has given no evidence of humility or dependence on others, let alone on God, his maker and judge. He wantonly celebrates strong men and takes every opportunity to humiliate and demean the vulnerable. He shows no curiosity or capacity to learn. He is, in short, the very embodiment of what the Bible calls a fool. Um, but what do you really think? And seriously, what a, that's a seriously harsh attack. Christianity Today, who knew they like, could throw the heat quite that way? Vitriol. So here's the thing. Um, evangelicals, almost always with Republicans, on Election Day, which is, what's the story going to be? Is Trump going to have the normal evangelical turnout, or is he lose a bunch in this I day? think he's going to lose a lot of evangelical women in the same way that he's going to lose a lot of women overall. Um, I think that there are some evangelical, uh, sorry, some evangelicals who will stick with him on the, the singular basis of the Supreme Court right. and their desire to see Roe v. Wade overturned, and that for them is enough of an issue. It's a signature issue, a flag-planting issue that they will... I guess stomach the rest of it, uh, the things that Christianity Today points out, and pull the lever for Trump. But I do think you will see divide between men and women. There was a Republican congressman on television last night um, on MSNBC, I believe, uh, talking maybe to Chris Hayes, who was asked um, if this congressman would abandon Donald Trump if he came out and announced that he enjoyed rape. And this Congress per congressman, I, can, didn't, I cannot remember which congressman it was. Maybe we'll have that soon later on the show. But he basically said, I have to think that over. Um, I find it I find it incredibly puzzling. I understand that Christian conservatives care a lot about the Supreme Court and care a lot about Roe v. Wade and have a sincere commitment to trying to curtail or end abortion in America entirely. But I do find it amazing how blithely so many of them hear the things that Trump has said and and, and admitted to, boasted about, talked about, and seem to have almost no care for it whatsoever, seem to pretend that he has in some way genuinely sought forgiveness or grace. I, I, I find it just incredibly weird that they don't even seem to be struggling with the moral implications of backing this guy who has done so many things that, according to their uh, theology are just sinful. Well, the invocation of grace is a powerful concept in the Christian faith, so we shall see. Coming up, WikiLeaks strikes again. We will discuss how the Clinton campaign has been responding to these disclosures when we come right back to you.
For the third day in a row, WikiLeaks has posted yet more allegedly hacked emails from the inbox of Clinton campaign chair John Podesta. One item today is getting some notice. It appears to be a message from Clinton's director of communications, Jennifer Palmieri, making fun of conservative Catholics. For the third day in a row, the Clinton campaign is responding to these leaks by calling the disclosures an attempt by Russia to meddle in American politics. Today, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov denied accusations that his country was involved in the email hack. But yesterday, Podesta cited an FBI investigation and told reporters that there was reasonable evidence that Trump's longtime associate Roger Stone has been giving the Trump campaign advance notice of the WikiLeaks emails. John, this case that the Clinton campaign is making is both an act of political deflection and it is a legitimate argument. How is that strategy working out? Well, I think, look, it's not doing anything to stem the discussion of these uh, emails. They're everywhere, right? They're on Twitter, and conservative media is obviously playing them big. Um, they're, they're, they, it is an act of deflection. They're, they're basically trying to say, pay no attention to the substance of what's in these emails. Just focus on the fact that this is Russia trying to meddle in our democratic process. I think we should all be really concerned about the fact that, by all accounts in the intelligence community, that Russia is trying to meddle in our democratic processes. As, as a matter of just trying to stem the tide, though, of discussion about this, I don't think it's working at all. I think it does throw back on us, in the press, a, a high standard of examination of some of these stories to try to figure out whether they belong on television and in print because, you know, a crime has been committed here, and some of these emails are dubious, some of them are insignificant, trivial, and some of them may have been doctored. We don't know yet, but everyone is being a little too, blah, a little too cavalier about this. Well, and I think you need to go no further than ClimateGate, which also implicated WikiLeaks and fundamentally derailed climate negotiations in Copenhagen, and it turned out that that information was adulterated in a pretty profound way, right. casting broad skepticism on the, the facts around climate change. So, to your point, this is something that needs to be handled and handled seriously. Right. There's some funny stuff that's gone on with these things. There's been some discussion of Kurt Eichenwald email where something that Eichenwald wrote in Newsweek magazine was, was the, the email was doctored to make it seem as though those words that he wrote were coming out of Sidney Blumenthal's mouth. Um, there, is these, there are these two instances where the Trump campaign is alleging collusion between the Clinton campaign and the State Department and the Department of and, Justice. And the Department of Justice. And in both instances, the things that are alleged as collusion were things where they were giving notification of, a, of, of, of a hearings that were going to hear uh, were going to take place that were actually public already by the time they were supposedly colluding. They were on the DOJ website or whatever. I, I just think people have to be really careful about these things. I'm not saying that the Clinton campaign is innocent of all charges. Sure. I'm just saying everybody's got to examine these things with great diligence about both the motives and about the actual facts, the, substance the actual of substance, the, the leaks, what, what these emails purport to. B. All right, when we come back, we will bring in a surprise guest from Donald Trump's campaign rally in Florida. You may recognize him once we reveal who it is. We'll see right after this.
as you're all perfectly aware by this point, I am here in New York City with Alex Wagner. But my usual co-host, who's not here, is down in rainy Lakeland, Florida, with NBC News correspondent Katie Turr, where Donald Trump hosted a rally earlier today. So, Mark Alperin, how's the weather down there? And what's your takeaway from this event? really sunny. Yeah. Alternately, really sunny and too hot and rainy. Yeah, and he's not even getting me yeah. with the umbrella. Can yeah. we just note yeah, well, that? We're sharing the umbrella. Uh, John, thank you. Uh, Katie and I are down here uh, at this Trump event. He did another earlier event here in Florida, and we've gotten reports on that. But let's talk first about uh, WikiLeaks. Oh, I'm sorry, let's talk first about Paul Ryan. He mentioned him earlier today, said kind of a weird thing about him, and then didn't mention him today. What do you, what's your sense of the state of how the campaign wants to, and Trump wants to talk about his fight with Paul Ryan. I think it's a very complicated relationship. I think the campaign wishes uh, that the GOP leadership was on board with them more. Certainly Paul Ryan. You heard Kellyanne Conway this morning telling GOP leadership, and she used this word, uh, to stop pussyfooting around and get behind Trump. They believe it's a, uh, that he would do better if they were behind him. You heard uh, Donald Trump basically implying that something, that something nefarious was going on, accusing Paul Ryan of uh, disloyalty at the event. Before this, he didn't mention it here. Uh, I get the sense that he's kind of going off script with that, that he's talking about it on O'Reilly, uh, he's tweeting about it, then Kellyanne Conway goes and is trying to mop up uh, the mess that he's made, uh, because it doesn't seem like these are things that he's reading off a teleprompter, right. certainly. This seems like when he's uh, going off script and um, just can't help himself. Yeah. I mean, as John and Alex talked about earlier, you are hearing some Republicans now who repudiated him over the weekend, pulling back and saying they support him. I'm hearing from Republican sources that other Republicans are saying privately they regret going out so far and repudiating him over the weekend because they're hearing from loud and angry constituents who are saying, why are you abandoning the Republican nominee? You're only helping Hillary Clinton. Yeah, but then there are other there are other Republicans and other, um, you know, swing state operatives, important people who say that they're appalled and they're embarrassed by this campaign, that they uh, wake up every morning and wonder if this is a day that they should quit. So there's there's a tug of war going on within the GOP, and it, one, it makes you wonder where they're going to be when this is all over. Yeah. It seems that the Republican base is going to be angry at them no matter what. Is the Republican base enough for them to, you know, go forward and win elections in the future. That remains to be seen. Uh, meanwhile, uh, because they've stood behind Trump, gone back and forth, refused to, uh, you know, get away from him after he trashed Latinos, after he trashed uh, Muslims, and now he's trashing women with um, uh, that 2005 audio tape, you could say. Uh, there's a whole class of people who are just disgusted by, by the, you know, the back and forth in the Republican yeah. Party. And I think a lot of the tale will be told on the next round of polls. If the next round of polls show a tightening of the race, I think you'll see people stop repudiating him for the most part, and some people come back. Let's talk about WikiLeaks. I was uh, impressed, I'll say, to some extent today, with the fact that he's done, he, he's doing something now, not on a regular basis, but it's sporadically, taking the best of the WikiLeaks stuff politically for them and integrating it into his speech in a way that audiences can understand, not just the audiences here, but on TV, people can understand what's his point. Hillary Clinton is part of a corrupt Washington culture, doing business as usual. I, I, don't, I don't recall him doing that with any sort of Clinton stuff. Even in the debate the other night, I thought he was too elliptical, a little bit more specific here and concrete, I thought. I think you're right. I think with WikiLeaks, what he has is some concrete evidence of the narrative that he is trying to push forward, that Hillary Clinton is uh, working behind the scenes, not in your best interest, but in her own best interest, uh, that she's somebody who's so hungry for power, hungry for the presidency, uh, that she will do anything, say anything in public, even though it's uh, not quite her private persona. He, he got it a little bit more at this rally here. He hit it a little bit harder, but he's not consistent with it at all. And he, he says it so sporadically that it doesn't allow uh, the media to say, hey, you know, here's the, the message that Donald Trump is going on. Instead, he's, you know, talking about trash. Here, but goes off it, it, but it, it doesn't it doesn't do anything to get him the attention in the national media that he is looking for because he's constantly doing and saying things that distract from that message. Yeah. I thought, you know, we're talking about his mood versus the mood of the crowd. You mentioned earlier that the, the crowds are less uplifted and more angry than early on. Yeah. But I think I, my sense is, again, from watching... All right, so it looks like we've lost Mark and Katie. Maybe that thunderstorm down there was a little bit more severe than we thought. Um, Alex, um, those two are having this discussion about, uh, about how this thing is playing out. It is interesting that we've got a bunch of cross currents happening here. Mm -hmm. you know, there are, you know, there is, the, 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 it's really disarray now. I mean, before you had, we're in a situation where it looked like there was a possibility that the party was just going to wholesale abandon Trump. Yeah. Then the debate happened, and now you've got very distinct factions and parts of the party with really all trying to figure out, like, 
what am I supposed to do here? Yeah. What are what are the risks? What are the traps? Where to go? And nobody really knows what the right strategy is. Well, you're also talking about a candidate who's been very undisciplined in this particular moment. Given the fact that the WikiLeaks came out on Friday in a very sort of fortuitous yes. bit of timing, this could be the week where there is much more ex explanation and discussion about the, the precise content of WikiLeaks, and instead we're talking about infighting in the Republican Party. There was no need for this to happen, and one wonders what the relationship between politics Ryan and Donald Trump is whether Ryan could have been brought back from the ledge if there had been a phone call made after the debate on Sunday night. I don't know what that relationship is like and whether it's beyond yeah. repair. I mean, I think the interesting thing is a lot of people speculate about whether Trump understands that he's likely to lose and is he setting himself up to run a media empire or something after he leaves an, an anti-Clinton media empire. I think the more just pertinent question is, if you think about him talking about the election being stolen, him blaming the media and him blaming the Republican establishment, he's starting to just lay out a predicate for all the excuses yeah, for why he Don't forget the rigged lose. election. That and is also a big part of it. Rigged system, rigged election, all that stuff. I just, it's just all about trying to set up a whole edifice of, here Here's why I lost and here why you all should stay angry about this. All right, again, our thanks to Mark and Katie Turr down in Florida, even though we couldn't get that whole interview. Coming up, we're calling in the surrogates. We'll have two of them joining us when we come back. Happening in the political world. Here to tell us is Matt Schlapp, chair of the American Conservative Union and a Trump supporter. Matt, I did not actually write that joke, so please, I apologize for saying it. Oh, no, he loves I it. I think you can he take loves it, though. It. He's Matt, loving it. What, what are you talking about? Schlapp what, loves that joke. Matt, we have been talking about this rift in the Republican Party. Who can fix it? Can one man fix it? Uh, clearly not. Uh, no, I think uh, this is a really interesting question because because we are having, you know, you have that family you look at that looks so perfect and everyone's perfectly dressed and they look like they never yell at each other. That's kind of what the Democrats look like right now. The Republicans look like that family that's like all discombobulated and shouting. And I think <laughs> we're not uh, we're not exactly putting our best foot forward right now, but it's honest. It's what happens in political parties at moments like this. And I think we'll get through it okay, but it's going to be choppy. Matt, it's never happened before. It's not what happens in political parties. You never had a nominee waging, well, war, waging, waging war on his party from the, from the precipice, or from the, the, the heights of being the party's nominee. Donald Trump's, like, attacking some of the most esteemed figures in your party. So just tell me how, in what world is that politically helpful to Donald Trump and to the rest of the party? 
I don't think it is helpful. I think it would be better if we talked about this. Central, I think Donald Trump is connecting with voters on these issues of the economy, uh, lack of good paying jobs. What is our uh, strategy against radical Islamic terror? And I think he's got the right approach on taking on Washington. The American people think that Washington is completely broken. If we stay on this track, I, I worry about our chances. If we get back on the issues, uh, I think we got. I think we got a fighting shot here. But Matt, but, you're, Matt, you're a, you're a Trump supporter, right? I am, famously, right? So, what explains, if it's obvious to you that this is not the right thing for Trump to be doing, attacking his party in a, in the way that he is, what explains what's going on in his mind that makes him think that this is the right thing to do, either for himself or for the rest of the party below him? Let's face it. We all know that yes, he's running as the Republican nominee, but he's an independent guy as well. He's really occupying both those lanes. And when these Republicans took out against him uh, after the aftermath of the tape on Friday, I think it upset him. Uh, there was a herd mentality. People bolted. And some of those people have come back, like uh, Senator Deb Fisher from Nebraska and the Republican nominee in Colorado. And because uh, they realized when they, when they bolted from Trump, what did that mean? That meant that what are they going to do, vote for Hillary? Uh, and I think that they're both realizing they need each other. Um, and that's what I want the party to get back to. The down ballot candidates need a strong presidential candidate, and that presidential candidate needs those down ballot candidates to help him in those states. So, in the end, I'm hoping this was a dust up that lasted a bit too long, and we can get back to attacking Hillary Clinton and winning this race. So, Matt, you're a compelling, persuasive, articulate presence. So, we decided we needed to balance you out with someone who's even more compelling, articulate, and uh, and persuasive. That would be Governor, former Governor of Michigan Jennifer Granholm, who now appears right next to you on our wall. Um, Governor, let me ask you this question. Um, how much of a problem do you think it is politically for the Clinton campaign, they, these now three days of WikiLeaks emails that have, been, uh, that have been dropped out into the public? They're getting asked about them a lot. There's a lot of chatter around them. They're trying to swat it down. But how big a threat do you think this is to her campaign? I, I just don't, I don't think it's, uh, it's, I mean, from what we've seen, there just isn't much there there. So there's really not, not much to be worried about, it doesn't seem, certainly from what's, what's been released. But I think the, uh, the bigger concern really is, why is WikiLeaks um, dripping this out so slowly? If this WikiLeaks is supposed to be the entity that releases everything to the public, what is going on with this slow drip? I mean, it certainly lends to the suspicion that WikiLeaks is doing some bidding on behalf of perhaps either uh, Trump through Russia, Russia through Trump. I don't, you know, I'm not going to make a big deal about this because it's been said out there. We know the FBI has been, has confirmed, I think, uh, or at least has been telling the Wall Street Journal, which just reported that, in fact, the Russians um, are likely to be the source of the leak through WikiLeaks. But bottom line is, the drip, drip, drip is frustrating from this perspective, is that she's <laughs> Hillary Clinton is out there talking today about the child care tax credit. Right. I mean, Matt, we were, we were just talking about this. She, she's going high. She wants to have people understand the policy. She's with Al Gore yesterday talking about climate change, which is really an Governor. important issue. Governor, so. having said that, though, uh, there is stuff in those emails that confirms a lot of suspicions people have about Hillary Clinton. I mean, even in the best case scenario for the Clinton team, what you learn in reading those emails, as my colleague at The Atlantic, Russell Berman, said, is that Clinton is very much a politician. The idea that she has a public facing position and a private facing position, the notion that the Clinton Foundation uh, and then Taneo and some of the relationships that Bill Clinton brokered uh, or that his deputies may have brokered, I mean, this. this this is confirmation for people who have believed that the Clinton Foundation is somewhat corrupt or just not playing by the same rules, that Hillary Clinton is not playing by the same rules as, as we hold perhaps other politicians to. This would seem to be a sort of confirmation. Do you think the campaign needs to address that head on? I just I think they have been addressing this these suspicions ad nauseum throughout the course of the campaign, Alex. What they really want to do, and I think what people want to do, is to talk about what she's going to do for people once she's elected. Why is it going to be better for for parents that she's doubling the child care tax credit? Why is it going to be better for millennials that we actually have a president who believes that climate change is real and is caused by humans and is going to, by the way, create jobs in the clean energy sector so that people can have them here as good 
good-paying jobs in America, that she's got a super robust plan to do that. This is my particular passion, and I'm so excited that there was an opportunity to speak about that yesterday. And yet this, you know, these WikiLeaks things, which I, I know is very beneficial to the other side, because they can keep holding it up. But the irony about it, Alex, is that you see this report, for example, from Newsweek, from a reporter whose email appeared in this WikiLeaks batch, which was, in fact, manipulated. Right. So the, the, the email that comes out is not, in fact, accurate. Yep. So you can't even validate that these are true emails. And it gets back to the point about what the heck is Russia doing I interfering in our elections. And by the way, can I just say one other thing that happened today? And I just want to make sure I say it before, before you end the segment. <laughs> when you compare this, I have to say it. When you compare this to what BuzzFeed is reporting and now Time is reporting about Donald Trump saying that, you know, over the weekend, there was the tape that was released saying that because he owned the Miss Universe pageants, that he had the ability to go in the back and inspect the merchandise. He didn't use that word, but essentially that's what you take away and come to find out today that he was also doing this walking into the dressing rooms right. of Miss Teen USA, where 15-year-olds are undressing to get ready for the swimsuit portion of the pageant. Right. That there are women who were who were feeling young women, girls, who are exposed to this man who's walking through. To me, that kind of Governor. stuff where you talk about the Governor. character of this man, that is outrageous. Okay, Governor, yes. I got I gotta let Matt Slap talk for a second before we actually do have to end the segment because that was a an extended and passionate yes. um, uh, indictment of Donald Trump on a lot. Yeah, there the fists are up. Jennifer Granholm's <laughs> fists are up. Also, I'm really glad that it was you. But not to Matt. Not yes. to Matt. Not Matt to and Matt. I agree that we Understood. should be talking about policy. Schlapp, you have the yeah, floor. You have the floor. You have the floor to either defend Donald Trump, respond, attack, whatever you want. Go for it. Take your take a little time. I'm going go. for it. Nice. <laughs> okay. And I not think the governor does it. The governor does a great job advocating for her candidate, but really the candidate is her own worst enemy. You know, much of what we've learned over the course of the last several days were in the transcripts of these speeches. And why didn't she release those transcripts? Because those tran transcripts basically indict her for being the politician, John, that you just described her to be. Oh, I've got to have a public position, which is actually different from my private position. My private position is very corporate, very bank friendly, very Wall Street friendly. I'm one of you, wink, wink, nod, nod. Oh, yeah, those refugees, we really can't vet them. We have no idea who's coming here. Uh, that is an issue. Then she talks about trade and the fact that she's actually a complete free trader. She wants to have open borders. I mean, this is insane. This woman for 25 years has flip-flopped between being a progressive and being a centrist. She can't decide which lane to occupy, so she tries to occupy both lanes. She's a centrist for the corporations that pay her $200,000 a speech, and she's a progressive when she has to take on Bernie Sanders. I don't know which Hillary Clinton's going to show up for the general election, but I think she should actually start talking about policy instead of calling us all haters, saying we're deplorable, saying now I've learned that I'm backwards as a Catholic. She needs to stop the name calling and she start talking about that, what people Matt. care now, about. Well, well, we gotta go. the she did not say that. that. Unfortunately, go. Matt, Governor her, Granholm, her senior staff did. We, we have to leave it there. I'm sure this conversation will continue. Thank you both. When we come back, we're trading in the surrogates for the strategists. And if you're watching us in my hometown of Washington, D.C., you can now listen to us on the radio at Bloomberg 99.1 FM. We'll be right back.
We are joined now by Rick Tyler, the former spokesman for Ted Cruz's presidential campaign. He is now an MSNBC political analyst and comes for us from Washington, D.C. And here in the studio, Corinne Jean-Pierre, a senior advisor to MoveOn.org and a Democratic strategist who was a White House regional political director and deputy campaign manager for Martin O'Malley's presidential campaign. Uh, lady, gentlemen, yeah. <laughs> thank you for being here. Rick, I'm going to read something to you from New York Lydia. Times today about the potential down-ballot implications of Donald Trump's war on the Republican Party, okay? Here's the sentence. The nightmare possibility for the party, that's your party, is that swing voters punish the party because of Mr. Trump, the anti-Trump Republicans stay at home, and Mr. Trump's base cast a ballot for him and then leaves the polls. So, how plausible do you think that scenario, nightmare scenario, is for your Republican Party? I think it's increasingly plausible. It wasn't for a while because the presidential campaign has gotten so much media attention that it's sort of been isolated. The down ballot races have been going on and national media hasn't been paying much attention. Uh, but now that Donald Trump is in open war uh, with the Republican Party and its leadership, principally uh, Speaker Ryan, uh, I think it's going to, and, and of course this tape, because every uh, reporter is going to ask every candidate about the tape, uh, I think it has a potential to uh, yeah, to, to definitely hurt the ballot and definitely hurt the down-ticket races. Although right now I would say, John, that we'll probably keep the Senate marginally and I don't really think we'll lose the House. And the reason is I don't see a wave election. I don't see an attracting force getting behind Hillary Clinton uh, and, and overwhelming uh, the ballot box. And so I, I just don't see that it's going to be... At this point, at, it, it's not, it's not going to have a great impact. Kareen, how worried uh, should the Clinton campaign be that, that Ryan's strategy um, or, or the theoretical Ryan strategy that um, Trump may lose, but it's about keeping the Senate in Republican hands to act as a check on Hillary Clinton? How, how feasible do you think that strategy is? Look, I mean, I, I agree with uh, Rick somewhat in the sense of, like, it's going to be very difficult to get the House, for the Democrats to get the House. There's about 30 seats that, that they would have to pick up, which is just unlikely. But I think the Senate, we still have a, we still have a play there, right? The, the, if you look at states like even Florida, and there's a poll that came out over the weekend that showed that race tighten it up, I think, about three, four points. And so, so so that's something to think about too. But here's the thing. A month, for, for months now, we've been saying this is going to be a tight election. We've been saying that it's going to be single digits and it's not going to be a landslide. The polls that we have seen this week has her double digits or high, like, nine, nine, nine numbers. And so that's where we are right now. He's at 35, right? His ceiling was 40, 41. He couldn't even win with that. So what's happening is that all these down ballots have to be, are now attached to all of that. So, so these, sen these senators and congressional members have, who are still with him, or have left, they're kind of in a trick box, right? If you if you've left him, you're losing the Trump, you're losing the Trump supporters. If you're with him, you have to take everything that comes with Trumpism. So here's the question I have for you: If you're a down ballot Democrat and you're in a in a House race that might be competitive under certain circumstances, or in a Senate race that is, what do you want the Clinton campaign to do? Obviously, you'd like them to spend some money, and you'd like yep. uh, priorities to spend money in your district or your state, but. Their strategy for a long time has been try to peel off Republicans to come over to Hillary Clinton, not focus on energizing the Democratic base. If you're one of those Democrats, what do you want them to do for you strategically? I think it's really important to energize the Democratic base. Absolutely. That's why it's important to have President Obama out, Michelle Obama, Vice President Biden, right? And Bernie Sanders, of course, right? And I think them being out there and, you know, speaking on her behalf is ex extremely important and will energize that base. Because without that, then you're going to have a problem. But here's the thing, right? What they're focusing on right now is voter registration, early voting program. We know when you have a strong field program, and you know this, John, you can move the needle between, you know, three to five percentage points. And 40 percent of the general electorate is going to vote early. That's how Obama won in 2008. That's how we won in 2012. So that is what, the, you know, that is what the, the campaign needs to really focus on. And that's what they're doing with their sur surrogates. Rick, Donald Trump has been talking a lot about a rigged election. Uh, some Republican officials have come out today and in recent days saying he needs to stop talking like that, that it could be detri detrimental for American democracy in the future. What are your feelings on it? Well, D Donald Trump says everything he loses is rigged, right? So if the debate goes wrong, it was rigged. Uh, my microphone didn't work. I couldn't hear the question in the earpiece. Uh, the, the moderators were unfair to me. It goes on and on and on. Uh, but look, I th Alex, by the way, it's great to see you. I missed you. But, uh, <laughs> it's it's been, to see you, it's been a It's been... Um, 
Look, I, I think this is now focused on post-election. Uh, they know they can't expand the base. The only thing they can do is now is scorched earth strategy. That's what they're doing to try to suppress the Clinton vote. But Donald Trump is an imperfect messenger to suppress her vote. So I don't know how much impact that's going to have. But I think after the election, they are going to consolidate an organization that's going to be anti-Hillary. That organization will be uh, very lucrative. Uh, and they're going to, we're going to be, well, you're seeing it now. The party is splitting. Right. It's basically splitting between um, what I would call the bright, bright wing of the party who believes win at all costs. It doesn't seem to have an underlying philosophy, or I don't know what it is because it's at odds with a lot of Republican Party principles like free trade. Uh, then you have conservatives, and then you have the establishment, which represents the status quo. Will we go back to the establishment, or will the conservatives finally figure out how to make conservatism an attractive message again Rick? and take over the party? So that's just going to be a big brawl. Rick, real quick, yes or no, is the election over? Presidential election over? Yeah, it's, it's, it's over. over. Is yeah. that presidential election Absolutely. Over? There's no path to 270 for Donald Trump. Why are we here? Democrat, <laughs> well, what are we doing? Somebody's got to pay the mortgage. <laughs> it's not, it's not, it's not going to be you. It's not going to be right. me. Rick Tyler, Karine Jean-Pierre, thank you both. We'll turn to the fourth estate after this. New York Times media columnist Jim Rutenberg in the house. Ayo, Jim, good hey, to see hello. you. Hello, hello. Um, so here's my question. We've been talking like a little Alex bit. Did the AO. That was yeah. a good. Well, well, that's how it was spelled A-O. in the A-O. teleprompter, A-O. and I read the teleprompter. Don't generally. watch a lot of Howard Stern, apparently. Here's what I'm going to ask you, Jim. We've been talking about WikiLeaks, and through the show, there's been some consternation about whether sort of leaked material that hasn't been vetted through normal channels is safe for discussion, and especially given WikiLeaks' track record. As a, as a media guru, what's your thinking on that? I mean, the material's out there. We have to use it, I think, right? Like, how could, it doesn't matter where it comes from if it's true. That said, it's uncomfortable. If it's a foreign government hacking into these emails and unearthing them, that's, and that's a huge story. It's like an incredible propaganda story on the, Russian behalf, on the Russians' behalf. But I don't know how you, what do you do? You ignore this stuff? Is, I, your, is, your, is your view, well, look, let me ask you just a question, a press question. What's the press's view about, at this moment, about, like, burgled material? If somebody broke into Clinton campaign headquarters, stole a bunch of stuff, and then put it out, the New York Times, the Washington Post would say what about that? Burgled is okay. We have increasingly been using it when it is in the sort of public national interest or story interest. And it started with the Sony hack. The Sony hack was stolen 
emails and we ended up going there. I think there was some squeamishness, but it's the era, it's the WikiLeaks era. Right. So, you know, people just expect now that this is going to be out and we're going to use it. But that said, I, I'm not saying it's comfortable and it's right. especially. And doesn't government. it inevitably have a chilling effect? I mean, will campaigns and all political operatives and administrations stop using emails as a form of correspondence, public records, FOIA, that is gone in a, in a lot of ways after this. They may, but I don't know how they're going to communicate, but we'll, someone will figure something else out. Yeah, and then are, they'll tap into the phones. Are you not on signal? Uh, I'll get on it right away. <laughs> <laughs> it's a deep tease for later. Yeah, it's a really deep tease for later. Here's the thing. You said, obviously, if it's, if it's true and in the public interest, people, the inclination is to publish, right? But again, there's some question, again, the Eichenwald story um, suggests that, you know, there's been manipulation of these documents. So again, just as a matter of reportage, do you think there's like right now going on in newsrooms and broadcast operations a higher degree of scrutiny being given to these things than would normally be given? I mean, just to say, well, is this really what they wrote? Is this language? Does that sound like who this person is? How do we verify that these emails were actually the emails sent? You've got Jennifer Palmieri today saying about this Catholic uh, story that she they impugned the Catholic Church in some way. She's saying I never I don't recognize these emails. They're right. not. I never sent them. I don't. I never. She's saying I never. I don't recognize sending this email. So what's a news organization to do in that situation? I think it's the same as any story. You have to verify it you have to try to nail it what would be unhelpful and I get it where it's, it's not pleasant and it's, maybe it's not even fair to the Clinton campaign but if they play any games about what is valid and what isn't and we learn okay this email was legitimate then we've broken the trust so hopefully they're being honest about what's fabricated um, I get it where they feel like why do we have to help the Russians undermine our campaign I do get that <laughs> and I don't have a good answer for that but it, just so we're all, it's happening and we all have to deal with and it. And how do you think that standard applies to a hot mic moment? Um, same deal. I mean, uh, corporate siblings of NBC had to deal with that. And I, they obviously concluded, after cautious lawyering, that they could use the hot mic that Donald Trump... Or the Washington Post, which was the first to release it. Is it, it... Go ahead. Well, that made it easier. The Washington Post had a much easier decision because it wasn't the Washington Post's hot mic. And to them, like, that was public interest. Now everybody's talking about, let's get these apprentice tapes and go through them to find more hot mic yeah. moments, which, interestingly is a WikiLeaks mentality, like, right. hey, why this aren't they just dumping asking. all of this right. stuff? Why can't we just search it? I mean, I don't, how are you going to search thousands and thousands of hours of tape? We'll figure out a way if it gets, gets to that. Well, let us try to help you out. Oh, your next story, you have the big P. You want to work on a story about Trump's last debate performance, right? Uh, I'm thinking about that. Well, yes. What's that going to be about? Wait, oh, his last debate no, performance. Or the next debate? Or the next debate performance. Well, the next debate is obviously could... I hope that we all in the media um, just remember that we're going to see the world in a whole other way after the next debate, right? Like right now, it's like, is it over? It's like, you guys were just talking about that. Maybe it is, but the next debate will reset it once again. Or not, but it's possible. <laughs> it ain't over. Talk about definitive. Till that's it's why we like having hey, Rudenberg on the show. It may be over, I'm, but it I'm probably isn't. I'm media columnist. <laughs> a deep thinker. Yeah, I need a Jim beer. Rutenberg, thank you for your time and thanks. thoughts. We'll be right back. Thanks for having me.
Fish. Bloomberg does. <laughs> Head to BloombergPolitics.com right now to see the latest in our Battleground 2016 Voter Mass series about how Hillary Clinton is trying to make inroads with military voters. We're going to talk about that on the show later this week, too. Coming up on Bloomberg Technology, Lightspeed Venture Partners, Jeremy Liu. Thanks to Alex Wagner, who's the best. Until tomorrow. <laughs> Namaste. I'm Mark Crumpton. You're watching Bloomberg Technology. Let's begin with a check of first word news. In Syria, an airstrike on the biggest market on the rebel-held side of Aleppo reportedly left at least 15 people dead. A month-long assault from Syrian and Russian warplanes has devastated Aleppo.